All right. Sound the alarm proclamation. Whereas Durham is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting the city, and whereas home fires continue to be a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are where people are at the greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 3,400 people and injured 14,670 people in the United States in 2017, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and whereas the risk of dying in a home fire is cut in half in homes with working, smoking al with working smoke alarms, and whereas more than one-third of home fire deaths result from fires in which no smoke alarms are present, and whereas more than half of home fire deaths result from fires reported at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when most people are asleep, and whereas residents should install smoke alarms in every sleeping room, outside each separate sleeping area, and on every level of the home. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim, says April 27th, April, uh, but I'll say April 15th, 2019, as Sound the Alarm Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to be prepared and to support the efforts of protecting their homes and families. We encourage all residents to ensure their home is protected with working smoke alarms. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 15th day of April, 2019. Chief Zoller. Mayor Shul, Mayor Shul, members of council, on behalf of the 418 men and women of the Durham Fire Department, and I'm trying to say Durham better. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, thank you. I'm working really hard at that. Thank you so much for the proclamation tonight. I, I want to tell you really why it's the 27th and what's it about. It's about our, our fire department getting into the community every Saturday all summer long for 19 straight weeks. There are 19 stations in the fire department. That's why we're doing 19 weeks. That means for two hours every Saturday, we're going door to door to put up smoke detectors and share our safety message. We're going to be focused. Thank you. We're going to be focused on one station every every week. That's why there's 19, and we're really looking forward to getting it out in the community. If I could, real quick, introduce uh, with me Captain Carol Reardon. Really fast, on April 27th, along with 12 of the chapters of the Red Cross and th over 300 volunteers, we will be doing a Sound the Alarm event. We'll be installing 1,000 smoke alarms across the city of Durham. We're staging at Witted School and we will be working across the city. So it, this is a great opportunity for Durham. Raleigh installed 800 last year, so we're at least gonna do 801. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for 1,000. I have 1,000 to install and we're gonna get, we're gonna do 1,000. <laughs> Thank you. so much, council member. Thank you, captain and chief. We appreciate you. For our last item, me gustaría invitar al podio al alcalde, Juan Pablo Barquero, y a todos nuestros amigos de nuestra nueva ciudad hermana de Tilaran, Costa Rica. Woo! Yeah! You go, boy. Everybody got in on it tonight. También me gustaría invitar a Ilba Prego, Presidenta del Comité de Tilaran, y Roxana George, Presidenta de la As Asociación de Costa Rica, a unirse a nosotros. Come on up, everybody. Oh, that's sweet. It's a baby here. And I'm going to ask Council Member Caballero to join me. She's already know, right? great. Yeah. Please come up. <laughs> Keep coming. There's room for everybody. Esta noche, in mi oficina, el alcalde y yo.
firmamos un acuerdo de cooperación entre nuestras dos ciudades. Quiero dar la bienvenida al alcalde Barquero a Durham, junto con todos nuestros nuevos amigos de Costa Rica. Esperamos una relación larga y fuerte entre la gente de Durham y la gente de Teleran. Ahora tendremos algunos comentarios del alcalde Barquero. Good evening. My English is not good, but I will try. <laughs> so I apologize for this. <laughs> Yesterday, I had the opportunity to hear in the Church of Duke that only successful people get up again, a phrase that reflects the history of Duran, because when the American tobacco left Duran, you managed to get up and turn Duran into an impressive city which evidences its development in every corner. The regulation of buildings and the management of public space reflect an excellent pl planning order and have managed to build a beautiful city. My country, Costa Rica, is small, but has many things to offer and experiences to share. I am one of the youngest mayors in Costa Rica. And I, and I feel so happy that today we can sign this agreement to establish, establish this twinning with a successful city like yours. Tilarang is a beautiful town with an exuberant nature, with many landscapes, surrounded by mountains, and wind, and friendly, honest, and hard-working people. Tilaran was the first city in Latin America to produce energy based on wind, and is where the largest lake in our country is located where Water-based energy is also produced. Our region produced 44% of energy of Costa Rica. And in my town, the two main energy sources of the percentage are located. Today, it's well like to thank God for being here to all of you to the mayor, to sister cities, especially to Mr. Brady, to the commu community of Tilaran in Duran, especially to Mrs. Ilba, who is for her than we are here to Melis, Melissa, to Patricia, and the all members of the Costa Rican Association in Durham, represented by its president, Roxana. We are pleased that you can be here in this important day. I hope we can continue building bonds on friendship and on behalf on our entire Costa Rican delegation. I want to thank you for the welcome you have given us. They have made you feel like home. I want to end with the words that characterize my country. The phrase is pura vida, pure life. <laughs> when used when used 
eat for everything. <laughs> to welcome, pura vida. To say goodbye, pura vida. <laughs> to say that we are well, pura vida. <laughs> so every time you hear this phrase, pura vida, that symbolizes that there is a Costa Rican. Thank you, thank you very much, and um, pura vida. Pura vida. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Ilba Prego if she would also just like to say a quick word to us. Would you like to add anything? Yeah. Hola, good evening. I'm so grateful and so excited and for the support of both mayor to bring our two communities together, um, our sister city, and continue with the friendship. The program is the sister city idea start with our exchange program for youth. I believe in youth changing life and have this great opportunity. And I would like to say thank you, Brady, and the all member of the different community for the great support that I have with you, becoming the sister city. Melissa, the director of the school district, she gave a great support. And my husband, Tom, that always has been supported and is here. Thank you, and we are so excited. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We appreciate having everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have a new sister city. And I'm looking forward to my first trip to Tilleran. Pura vida. Pura vida. Gracias, señor. Pura vida. Nailed it. <laughs> All right, council members, that was a lot more ceremonial items that we usually have, but okay, we, we're going with it. We're going with it. Um, and we're very happy to have our friends from Costa Rica here. I think they've had a wonderful few days, and it sure has been great uh, getting to spend some time with them. Okay. Um, now I'm going to ask, are there any announcements by members of the council? <laughs> Councilmember Austin. I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to echo um, your words. Uh, that's to start out our meeting uh, in recognition of the events from last week. Um, and so I'll just say simply that, you know, I want to express my sincere gratitude uh, for the very swift and heroic work by our staff and many of our partners. Uh, I want to honor the life of Mr. Lee I want to wish everyone who's been injured a, a swift uh, recovery and also just again kind of put a fine point on my gratitude to the fire department for the many lives that they certainly saved last week. And I, I just want to add um, our thanks for kind of our regional partners, including mm -hmm. folks in Wake County and I believe Orange County, who provided a tremendous amount of support um, last weekend and, and possibly even now. So just, just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Other colleagues, have any, anyone else would like to, uh, Council Member Freeman. I would also like to echo those words and recognizing how quickly and um, efficiently everyone worked to make sure the communication was available. And I want to also um, add in there the work of the American Red Cross. Could you say it again? I'm sorry. And the work of the American Red Cross. American Red Cross. Thank you. I left them out, but. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Middleton. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I want to, of course, echo everything my colleagues have said. Um, I, I used to fight with my little brother over getting one of those toys out of cereal boxes when I was a kid. And one time I pulled out the glow-in-the-dark car, and, and it wasn't working. My mom said, go in the bathroom and turn the light off. And uh, she explained to me that glow-in-the-dark toys work when the lights are out. 
And um, then my Sunday school teacher told me that glow is the same word as glorious, and that glory doesn't show up until the dark times come. Um, our first responders absolutely glowed uh, last week. They were glorious. Uh, it was a dark time, but the best of us came out. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Durham Fire Department, the Durham Police Department, all of our emergency responders. I think uh, Councilor uh, Austin uh, recognized our sister municipalities and those who sent uh, help to us. Um, it's hard to go through dark times and challenging times, uh, but it's such that uh, oftentimes our best glow comes out in those times, and we saw the best of Durham this past week and the darkest of hours. Um, I'm so grateful and so proud of the city, and our hearts continue to go out to the Kong family and to those that were injured, and we, we pray uh, their speedy recovery. Um, thank you, Durham. Thank you those that serve, to those that serve us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other announcements, Council Members? All right, thank you very much. And now I'll ask, are there any priority items by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone, members of council. And I, too, want to uh, first, Mr. Mayor and members of council, thank you for uh, taking the time to, uh, to make those, uh, those remarks and, uh, and to recognize uh, uh, the work of, of a great, great uh, group of employees. And I want to also extend my pride and appreciation to all of them, the leadership and the uh, first responders and all of the employees who played a part, uh, an important part, in, uh, in responding to that terrible situation last week. So thank you for that again. This evening, we do have one uh, uh, priority item, uh, which is agenda item number 10, the general classification and compensation uh, plan recommendations uh, pursuant to some of the uh, questions that you had asked during the work session. Uh, there is some additional information in response uh, that has been added as an attachment to uh, item, item six, or, or attachment six to item 10. And I believe you were notified of that earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Manager. I don't believe we need to vote on that. Uh, and now, uh, Madam Attorney, uh, any priority items? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and members of the community. City Attorney's Office has no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Good evening, everyone. The City Clerk's Office has no items. Thank you so much. And now we'll move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is uh, work that we have previously done, and an item, uh, the, the, the agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. An item can be pulled by any member of the council or any member of the public, and if it is pulled, it will be held until, uh, for discussion until the end of the meeting. Uh, item one, vacant positions performance audit, March 2019. Item two, approval of city council minutes. Item three, selection of the external auditor. On item four, comprehensive plan engagement services. Item six, families moving forward, 2017-18 community development block grant. CDBG or subrecipient contract for comprehensive case management services. Item seven, North Durham phase three hydraulic model. Item eight, Southeast region lift station award of construction contract to Heron Construction Company, Inc. Item nine, fourth amendment to the management agreement by and among city and county of Durham and Global Spectrum LP. Item 11, agreement to support Moog Fest 2019 operated by Moog Institute, Inc. using City of Durham grant funds. Item 12, amendment to manage security network and services Carolina's IT contract. Uh, item 21, resolution support of the Medicare for All Act of 2019. And I'm going to now accept the motion that we approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. We moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We do have here someone who has come uh, who wanted to speak on one of the items, and I'm going to go ahead and let that happen now. Uh, I believe Dr. Heather Kim is here. Dr. Kim? Is Dr. Heather Kim here? Dr. Kim, could you please come to this microphone right here, and uh, you have two minutes. You have two minutes, Dr. Kim. We're glad you're here. I will try to make it very fast. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the City Council for the uh, opportunity to speak here in support of the resolution to pa uh, support Medicare for All Act of 2019 on behalf of Coalition for Healthcare of North Carolina. Uh, I'm currently a fourth-year psychiatry resident um, and I spent the last, most of last Friday just arguing with insurance companies on prior, prior authorizations. This has very flushed in my mind. 
Um, so we as a country spend an enormous amount of money on healthcare collectively and individually, and we spend more than any other developed country on earth, um, and we don't really have the outcomes to show for it. Um, our current system forces people to change doctors every time they change their job if they're lucky enough to have insurance. Um, it forces doctors to become bureaucrats. It forces patients to make impossible choices. And just in the four years that I've been practicing in Durham, I don't know how many people have told me that um, they've only refilled their medication just once in the last three months because they didn't have enough money to pay their copay every month. And I don't know how many people who I admitted overnight for a hypertensive crisis or a heart failure or a heart attack or suicide who could have, whose admission could have been prevented by cheap, preventative, routine health care and medications they could have gotten as outpatient. Um, and I don't know how many people I didn't admit because they never just made it there. Um, and these are people who have insurance. These aren't even people who aren't insured. Um, even though the ACA has decreased the percentage of the uninsured by 50% during that time, uh, people who are underinsured, so people who have insurance and can't afford to use their insurance, has doubled in that time. So how can we wonder why do we have the worst outcomes for the most amount of money that we can spend? Um, our current system is a failure. It doesn't take care of patients. It doesn't make doctors happy. Um, and it's incredibly cost inefficient if the human suffering isn't enough to sway your mind. Um, the only people whose needs are met by the system are the health insurance executive and the for-profit hospitals um, and pharmaceutical executives. So considering where this discussion was just a few years ago, um, it makes me incredibly hopeful and optimistic to see that this resolution is being considered. Um, and I really do hope it passed tonight. Uh, by itself, it is not sufficient, but it's a necessary step forward in making our healthcare system work a little bit better for everyone else. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kim, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. And, and just to be clear, we did just pass that resolution. <laughs> yeah. And I hope it's influential. All right, uh, we'll now move to uh, item 10, general classification and compensation plan recommendations. Uh, we have a number of speakers to this item, but I believe we're first going to hear a presentation from staff. Yeah, not a presentation, Mr. Mayor, just staff is prepared to make any comments. Okay, response. staff is prepared. Okay, great. Good evening, Regina Youngblood, Human Resources. Presentation was provided on the 4th of April, so I'm here to answer any additional questions that were not answered by the attachment that the manager referenced earlier. Thank you so much. All right, I think what we will do is we will now proceed to hear from some speakers, council members, if this meets with your uh, approval, and then we'll follow that up with questions and comments. Um, and, and Ms. Youngblood, we'll get you back when we're speakers are done. Um, I have one, two, three. I have four speakers signed up for this item, and if you all could come down here to my right uh, and I will um, call you in this order. Uh, could y'all come down here, please? Thanks. First will be Dante Strabino. Second will be Donald Quick. Third will be Romy Gaddy. And fourth will be Sarah Vukalic. Mr. Strabino, you're first. Welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Greetings, uh, City Council. Uh, Dante Strabino, 2400 Yorkdale Court, uh, field organizer with the Durham City Workers, UE Local 150. I was hoping to go after some of the city workers, but... Uh, That's okay. If you'd like uh, to do that, we can arrange for us. that. Dante, uh, and, and, if, if you'd like to do that, I don't mind that. Who, okay. you know, it's okay with me. Sure. Um, yeah, that would be great. All righty, then I will call Donald Quick. Mr. Quick, welcome. You have three minutes. Please give us your name and address. How y'all doing this evening? Good. Uh, on behalf of the Durham City Workers UE 150, uh, we came with some, uh, I guess it's an issue or whatnot, but uh, over in our department, I'm over in Public Works. Right now, we got like 15.3% no hires over in water management, they got like 11.1. .1. Now, I know water management is supposed to be moving to their own facility. And once they move, then public works will be there. The thing I'm saying is we need some help because 
all this building, all this space we're going to have, I mean, who's going to be down there working? Right now, you know, uh, they're telling us weekend work. We got to work on the weekend. Uh, well, pretty much volunteer, but they're saying, you know, if people don't volunteer, then we'll have to work on the weekend. And we want to spend time with our families just like everybody else wants to spend time with their families. Also, in water management, we asking uh, that, you know, these guys, I mean, they pretty much work round the clock. And, and it's sad that, you know, they have to do this because they got families also. On the other hand, uh, Mr. Barnfield, we also we gave you a letter. We sent you a letter concerning uh, the issues of eight hours comp time for every week we are on call currently earn seven hours, number two, to be paid daily overtime for any time work beyond eight hours work days. To be, number three is to be allowed to take a day off after overtime or on call without losing vacation time. No additional on-call day requirements per year. Four years is enough. And basically, that's, that's my issue. We, we need some help, you know. Right now, we just, I mean, we doing the best with what we got, but we getting the work done. And I know it's about numbers, because every quarter, they come to us and they let us know the numbers of the potholes and the water and sewer repairs. And if y'all look around Durham, they putting up houses everywhere. And we going to get this work done. Pavement failures, all that. So. Our concern is, you know, we need some help. And I know they need it over in water management. I know they do. Because, like I say, them guys work round the clock. I mean, we had a main line bus. Them guys came out there and jumped on it and took care of it. So my thing to council and, you know, the city manager, you know, let's, let's get on this thing about getting us some help. Because I don't know exactly what the requirements are. I know they did back up some stuff to where, you know, we can hire more laborers and whatnot, but we also need to be skilled when we're out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quick. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Romy Gaddy. Hello, my name is Nelson Walker, and I work for General Service. Sir, and, uh, excuse me, uh, sir. Is, is Romy, I don't see Romy. Is Romy here? Okay, sir, you can go ahead and speak. You have three minutes. Once you've finished, I want you to go over there, please, and sign one of these cards, okay? All right. All right, go ahead. You have three minutes. Well, Give us your I'm name. I'm speaking now. for General Session. We, uh, first of all, we appreciate the raise we uh, supposed to receive this year. And uh, the workers uh, appreciate because uh, we work through rain, sleet, and snow. And we are still waiting on to uh, receive some better equipment. And not the war and pace of uh, certification in, in the future. There are, uh, there are important uh, certifications that are no longer going to be awarded with compensation, such as the water distribution and the collection certificate. General Service also has a pesticide certificate, and there are others. This incentive was important for employees to better themselves and seek compensation. Folding that into an unfair murder and evaluation system does not guarantee employers will be compensated for going above and beyond retaining their certificate. So employees would like to get uh, better pay and compensation on this uh, award uh, in the future. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Sarah Vukulich. Ms. Vukulich, welcome. Please Thank give us your you. name and address. You have three minutes. Sarah Vukulich, 710 Underwood Ave in Durham. Um, I do want to say really briefly, and there's a lot to say, so I'll be super brief about this. Um, our, I and our union and the Durham Workers' Assembly really stand in support and applaud the city council on the Medicare for All resolution. That's something that our national union is taking up around the country. In all of our locals, we're going to be pushing that issue with other progressive forces. And I just want to say briefly, it's great. We're excited that y'all are pushing that on the federal level. And we, just to put on your radar, we'd be really excited to be 
you know, pulling together with other progressive forces and with y'all to host like a town hall to keep, you know, raising the profile of that issue and building around it. So I just wanna uh, put that on your radar. I also wanna, you know, like the other workers who are, are speaking tonight, support um, and applaud the city council for, for creating a step plan. That's something I know the union's been fighting for since before I joined it, years before I joined it. And it's a huge uh, step in the right direction. Uh, I can't stand up here and not mention that part-time workers are still excluded from that, that the city has still not yet raised the bottom, that you know I have coworkers who work three part-time jobs um, and nobody should have to work three part-time jobs. In fact, one of my coworkers worked part-time and uh, Durham, Parks and Recreation, part-time carry, Parks and Recreation, and part-time at Caffeinate until, uh, until now. Um, and you know, it's a scheduling nightmare, we don't have health care, so it's sort of the least the city can do is, is actually pay part-time workers $15 an hour. I know it's a value people hold um, on the council, and it just, it just hasn't been moved forward yet. Um, so again, applauding the compensation plan overall, the main issues that we have as city workers are around these work issues, you know, and another issue that I'm gonna speak to a little bit is the process, the process through which the city came to um, the, through which the through which the city came to the um, the conclusions that it did about what how the, how we should work um, the occupation occupational panels that the city hosted that where they asked employees what they thought um, about their jobs about the classification systems about what would make sense um, two hundred nine employees were part of those panels and we public records requested that list and got it back we sent it to y'all to look at I really encourage you to look at it it's, it's very troubling it's you know all of the, the department directors, the assistant directors, the head of HR, um, the city manager himself counted as a worker. I mean, that's, that's actually ridiculous. And the city manager's office, the deputy city managers, these are the workers who were, um, whose input counted as workers, you know, that no blue collar workers had their input be a part of this process. This was not interviews with the workers who are working constant call duty, who are working constant mandatory overtime, who are getting held up at gunpoint in the middle of the night, who are gonna be most affected by our grievance process being rolled back um, through the new EPEP system. Uh, so, you know, through which uh, we can be put on probation, you can't grieve it, and then you can be fired, and you can't grieve it. That's, that's no grievance process. So those are some of the things to speak about. Hope Thank you all you. will take into consideration. Thank you, Ms. Wilkowitz. Dante Strabino. Welcome, you have three minutes. Please give us your name and address. Uh, Dante Strabino, uh, 2400 Yorkdale Court uh, with the Durham City Workers Union. Um, again, we do appreciate uh, the working with us and, and giving the extra month to hear from more employees. I know the last month was really helpful to hear from them. Um, and, and hopefully as and in the future, these kind of processes will be, will be more inclusive of the frontline blue collar staff. Um, because there are a lot of classification issues that a lot of folks have spoke to and a lot of things that we've written you all about that we hope to continue to work to beyond today. We hope that this gets passed, but we also hope that moving forward, we will have a seat at the table working with on-field administration to uh, hear from frontline employees um, more systematically because a lot of the lunch and learns and a lot of the, 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 the meetings that you come down, there's not a lot of follow-up with the employees and having a system of meet and confer with elected union officers will allow for a more firm system of follow-up on a lot of these uh, work issues, including, as we have mentioned, the additional job requirements that are now being uh, expected uh, to hire into some of these positions, um, uh, requirements for CDLAs, the requirements for uh, two years associate degrees. Um, this is gonna continue to uh, uh, make it difficult to fill these positions that need to be filled, um, and particularly in, in water and sewer where there's the, the, the upper eight managers are all white um, and, and you're out adding more discretion in there, it, it alarms us with, with the ongoing uh, concerns. Uh, you all just lost a very dedicated employee, Marcus Cates, who had been here many years, uh, an African-American employee who had been passed over many times. Um, his his equivalency, equivalency for his job degree was not considered, right? And these are the type of, just, these are the type of things that happen um, repeatedly that are pushing out um, qualified, skilled black employees and are getting overlooked for uh, promotions. Uh, and, this, and on top of this, uh, in order to advance through this new compensation system, one has to meet uh, an effective in their evaluation. Um, we have no you know, qualms with the concept of that. However, uh, if you're at the same time, you're also putting in place an, a whole new evaluation system, EPEP. But the timing of that is not a coincidence. Um, and in EPEP, 
we have a lot of concerns uh, where if employees are then found uh, less than effective, they're put on a six month probationary period, uh, at which point they can be terminated if they don't make effective at the three month or six month benchmark. They can be terminated with no right to grieve, with no right to access the grievance procedure. We think that that was really, really problematic. Um, we had a majority of the workers in the water department and public works sign a petition, along with many workers in general services and solid waste and parks and rec, ho hoping to move forward with the city to discuss and have a, a, a future conversation about a, a genuine fair grievance process, a process that the city manager cannot overturn, uh, decisions made by panel, um, and a process where frontline workers have representatives of their coworkers at all steps of the way, um, and also where they can grieve all matters, including evaluations and written warnings. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Trevino. All right. Uh, we'll ask Ms. Youngblood if you wouldn't mind coming back to the microphone. And I'm going to now open this up by any questions or uh, comments that members of the council might have. Council colleagues? Anybody? Right. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Regina. The, um, could you tell us a little bit about the breakdown of, of participants in the um, feedback, for lack of, I forget the nomenclature, the, the feedback sessions, uh, that breakdown of uh, execs relative to uh, frontline workers or, or blue collar workers, I think the term was used? Right. Well, I don't have a specific breakdown of that, but what I do want to talk about it was the is the purpose of those occupational panels. And I want to clear up something that is, uh, seems to be a misunderstanding. Every single employee had feedback into this process through their position description questionnaires. That was the mode by which we asked every employee to tell us what they did, how they did it, what certifications were required, what equipment was required, what education was required. Every single employee had an opportunity to provide that feedback. We, are, we received about 1,432 PDQs. Some of those PDQs represented multiple employees, so every employee had feedback into this process. The purpose of the occupational panels was to get feedback from selected groups of individuals who did specific types of work across the organization. So I think what Ms. Vukovic is concerned about is the fact that there were frontline workers in that group, but they, they feel that since there are more frontline workers being impacted by this recommendation, there should have been more frontline workers. The idea was to get a sampling of individuals who do all different types of work. So there was not a need to have an overabundance of representation of frontline workers in the occupational panel for operations. We also had occupational panels for individuals in finance. We had occupational panels for the executive series, which is why the city manager sat on that with the deputy city managers, because those were the employees that are being affected by the recommendations related to that particular structure. And so there was representation of all the different employees and all the different work and all the different levels in the organization. Um, what I can tell you about the demographics of that those panel members, uh, they were totally representative of the organization and more representative or additional sampling of females compared to males. So there was about 50-50 male-female and then the representation of the demographics mirrored mirrors the representation of the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I did remember one question I wanted to ask y'all. There was a concern brought up at the work session about the step plan being evaluated every two years and the range being evaluated every one. And at the time, it was suggested that we move to evaluate both every two. Is that a change that's been implemented? That's not something that I think that we should do because um, I think that the step plan being uh, evaluated every two years is appropriate for sustainability and affordability for the organization. Evaluating the open ranges every year doesn't put the employees necessarily in those open ranges at more of an advantage because when you move the ranges, the only people that get brought up are the people that fall below the new minimum more than likely you're not gonna have anybody being brought up. We're just extending the earning potential um, for those individuals at the maximums. So, so if we, 
We, we also talked about and the concern that was brought up was the overlap between the high B grades and the, the low C grades, mm -hmm. allowing us to move the open ranges on an annual basis instead of every two years helps us to spread that out. If we put them all on every two years, we continue to exacerbate the overlap. Okay. The, um, when the step plan gets moved up every two years, does everybody get moved up? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Anybody else? Okay. Um, the, there was a, a, a question raised by one of the speakers concerning uh, certificates, pay for certificates. Did you hear that comment? I did. Would I you did. comment on that, please? So, so some of the certificates that the speaker mentioned aren't actual incentives that are in place today. The only incentive pays are for the certificates in water management and forensics. And so I think the gentleman was talking about uh, certification pay and general services. Those, those incentives don't currently exist. Uh, we are recommending the folding end of the uh, certification pay for implementation purposes for individuals that currently have certifications in forensics and in water management. Um, we asked Donald Greeley, uh, Director of Water Management, to provide us with some additional information about the appropriateness of continuing incentive pay for those certifications. The information to my read that he provided uh, articulated most of all that the certifications need to continue to be in place for those areas for compliance where it is required. Those, those items being required uh, or certifications being required for certain positions are already a part of the minimum qualifications of the position and therefore individuals are being compensated through the compensation system for having those certifications. Um, he articulated future individuals obtaining certifications where they were not required would be good for their job development, would help them in their uh, ability to apply for higher level jobs. I think we heard from some of the speakers at the work session that no one would want to go for a certification if you did not pay them for it. Well, it seems that you would want to get certification so that you could be more marketable for higher level jobs. And that is exactly what uh, Mr. Greeley articulated. He also explained that there is a need sometimes to have some flexibility when it comes to emergency calls. And so again, we would encourage the department to work with its employees through constant coaching and um, mentoring to encourage them to get those certificates and they should be rewarded through the EPEP system and not through a certification incentive. In terms of the EPEP system, I know that there was some concern that our current evaluation system uh, is, it's, uh, I've heard it criticized by frontline staff uh, because they think that it's harder for them to get the exceeds uh, grade. Uh, so could you comment on the new system that is mm -hmm. being proposed and talk about uh, how you think that might change in, uh, mm -hmm. in the future? Well, it goes part and parcel with the step plan recommendation that we made for those employees, recognizing that there is a, a bit of difficulty in differentiating the work of individuals who work in teams. We're recommending a step plan so that those individuals who are effective or better in their performance will advance a step each year, representing a 4% increase. And those individuals who uh, perform above effective, which is highly effective or exemplary in the new system, will be eligible for lump sum increases above their 4% increase. How is this new system different? One, it provides, it provides for a lot more voice from the employee. Every employee has or has the capability of accessing the system to input information about themselves into the system so that the managers are familiar with the work that is being done. If the manager doesn't see everything that the worker is doing, if the work is completed away from the manager's supervision, employees have the ability to put input and feedback into the system so that managers are aware of what's happening, how they're doing the work. We are requiring managers to have a minimum of one one-on-one -on -one with their employees per month so that they are articulating expectations and level setting 
before the midterm and before the final evaluation so that they can clarify their expectations. We're asking managers to set goals with employees. We're also making sure that in this system, the supervisory critiques that currently exist that are supposed to be mandatory actually get done so that employees have feedback on their supervisors. Supervisors are also gonna be evaluated on their ability to supervise. <clears throat> uh, there was some confusion and misinformation that was stated by some of the speakers. The corrective action plans that will exist in the EPEP system, they exist today. They're just called uh, performance improvement plans. The current performance evaluation system allows for individuals who fail to meet standards. Uh, right now we have them on behavior and results. If they are rated as not meeting expectations on any one standard, they're put on a performance improvement plan that could lead to their termination. And now? And this will be the same, but hopefully with the additional feedback loops that we are mandating and requiring through this process, employees should be active participants in their own performance evaluations. I think it'll be really important to monitor that mm -hmm. over the next year to mm -hmm. see if employees really are in participating at the levels at which we hope that they will be. I think that's gonna be very important. Yes, and so the new uh, evaluation system, uh, the kickoff for the annual appraisal is gonna be next, nope, it's actually gonna be April the 22nd. And so we're actually gonna be scheduling road shows out to the operational departments to again suggest to employees to be active participants to show them again how to use the system and to answer any questions that they have. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Freeman. Just on that, just on the road show, I'm just wondering, especially for frontline staff, is there a time set in there for folks to actually interact with you on how to use it? Yes, so we're planning, so, so we're working with actually the departments to come to their normal staff meetings during their times. And so during those times, just as we've done in previous classes, we know that some of our frontline folks don't necessarily sit in front of computers, or none of them do, but many of them have access to smartphones their own or issued by the job. So we work with them to download the app onto their phone and show them how they can actively participate in their performance evaluation. Thank you, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, okay, other questions at this point? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, I um, just have one more thought. So one of the concerns that came up at the work session that we got an email about later regarding um, a job that y'all determined after going through a review, decided to reclassify um, to, a, to a different um, range based on some things that weren't fully understood when the employee was filling out the form. Yes. Um, after we approve this, assuming it gets approved, as things like that come up, I'm assuming we can go back and revise things. How would, um, how would employees, if they, if they feel like there is a mistake or there is an issue, ongoing, like ask for that to be reviewed and how is that review gonna work going forward? Right, so what we expect to do is to work through department directors. Again, once we um, get this all approved, we will do a refresh of the data based on all the feedback that we've received for any kind of discrepancy, inaccuracy, mistake, and then we'll ask departments to give that another review. At that time, they'll be able to share all of the information with the employees because it will have been approved. And if there are any mistakes, not misunderstandings or disagreements about classification, if there are any errors or mistakes, we will review them and we will make an adjustment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it was, a question was raised about uh, additional requirements, and this is something we talked about some in the work sessions, well, associate degrees and that kind of thing. Can you address that concern? Right, so we did mention during the work session, I think it is also something that we provided a little bit of feedback in our response to you as a part of attachment <coughs> six to this item, um, and it is the use of equivalencies that have been in place since about 2015. So these standard equivalencies apply for a high school and a GED plus four years of relevant experience, that equals an associate's degree. For a high school or GED plus eight years of relevant experience, that equals a bachelor's degree. An associate's degree plus four years of relevant experience equals a bachelor's degree. 
And so there are opportunities for individuals to qualify for these positions or higher level positions because anybody that's currently in a position is going to be grandfathered in regardless of the, the minimum requirements that have changed. But if they want to vie for higher level positions, there is a means by which to do that through equivalencies. How is that changing now? It isn't. So those standards that were set in 2015 are the same standards that we'll be continuing to use? That's correct. Um, I wanted to, uh, since our work session, um, I would say I've received five or ten emails from individual employees. I'm sure you also have received them. I'll send, I'll forward them to the city manager, but they are mainly things which I don't feel, I, I definitely did not feel qualified to evaluate their concerns. Uh, they were the kinds of things that the mayor pro tem uh, asked about a minute ago. Um, and uh, there were there were some engineers, uh, but there was also one from uh, a Parks and Recs, Parks and Rec employee. Uh, and um, again, uh, just so uh, I assume that you're going to be addressing all of these individual concerns, responding to the individual uh, who is expressing that concern uh, after evaluating their uh, the points they're trying to make. Yeah, I mean, more than 90% of them have already received a response. Yeah, okay, good. And so, um, and you'll be evaluating these new ones that we've received since the work session. Is That's correct. All right, any other comments? Just one final, just some mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Regina, thank you so much. You, you've been the comp and class plan whisperer for us, and I appreciate uh, your, your patience and thoroughness. In your professional opinion, if, if we adopt this plan, is there anything in your opinion um, in this plan that can be causally linked um, to, exas uh, exas um, to exhausting, um, I should say, frustrating our plans to achieve a diverse workforce? No. Is there anything that could even promote it? Is there, is there any causal linkage to our diversity in this plan of our workforce whatsoever? No, I don't think so. No, I think if we are concerned about diversity in the workforce, then we need to be looking at our recruitment and selection efforts, not our compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I do want to add that uh, at the request of uh, the council, uh, uh, one of the council members, I believe Council Member Freeman, uh, at, in the attachment, there are the, uh, the statistics for the city's workforce uh, in attachment six, I believe. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did see that, but I, I, I also heard the, um, the specter raised of yeah. oh, great. No, I, I causal wasn't link between yeah, us. No, I wasn't trying to respond to your question. No, I got it. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also wanted to add, I wanted to thank you for pulling that information together. I know it was kind of within the last two weeks, and I want to just press that it's not necessary for tonight's vote, but it would be good, good to know not just the race and gender, but also like who's at, within departments, there are professionals, there are clerical, there are admin, like just same way we break it out, if we could get to that point at some point in the year, that would be great to have that type of information available. Because mm -hmm. I think that, um, what I recognize is the comments that I'm hearing tonight are more around the systemic process and recognizing that you might have awoken some folks, you know, mindset into asking more questions about policies and procedures that are in place that they didn't know. And so I think this is a, this is a part of the process and I appreciate everyone's comments tonight. I appreciate everyone bringing you know, the questions that they're, they're having and the issues that you note, because if you don't, then we don't, we don't get to address it and it just kind of like burrows under the sand and, and bubbles up into what it doesn't need to be. Where, I mean, I think we're a council of very, um, informed on how race equity works, gender equity, pay equity. Like, I mean, I think this is a very um, strong progressive council that can, that can meet the challenge in addressing these issues. And I know that it's not gonna happen at one time with a pay and a classification, but I think that it did actually um, highlight some things that, that we might, have, might not have noticed before. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your work on this. I, I can appreciate the work that the community's been making, all the staff has been making, and, and just trying to make sure that we understand where the issues are, so. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make a couple of comments, and then if there are any others, uh, happy to take them, and then uh, I think we're probably ready to go ahead and uh, take some action. I uh, want to thank everybody that came. Thank you all for being here, to, and also for those of you who came for the work session. We appreciate you very much. Uh, for those people who are not here tonight but might be wa uh, watching uh, on, uh, on TV who had uh, spoken on this previously or written us, we're grateful. We were grateful to hear from our staff, and, um, and, I, th and I appreciated that when we did hear uh, from staff that our administration um, was very responsive, and I think that you all made a lot of changes. And Regina, I want to thank you for your responsiveness. I think you all worked hard to make a lot of changes in the system to try to meet the concerns that staff expressed. And I think what we're seeing now is very different from what we what was on the table a month ago. And and I and I appreciate your work to improve it. Um, I'll just make a couple of general comments about <clears throat> what I think about this. I, on the on the evaluation system, I actually think that the evaluation system is yet to be seen, but I think we're going to have a much stronger evaluation system in terms of employees' ability to impact their evaluations and to know understand their evaluations. Uh, and we'll see if that's true. Uh, I think we need to be very carefully monitoring this, uh, that the staff needs to be monitoring and uh, the, the participation of employees and making sure that that's really happening and is encouraged. But I think it's a good step forward. Um, I just think that the step plan is also uh, something that uh, our employees, especially our frontline employees, have been wanting for a long time. Uh, and I'm really glad that we have incorporated that. And also just want to say about the pay. I mean, this is a very large pay bump for um, most of our frontline employees. They're just looking at the statistics. <clears throat> We've, this will be about, about a $3.5 million increase of which $3.1 million is going to employees in the A and B bands. And the, uh, of the employees in those bands, there are 1,013 employees in those bands, and of those 1,013, 1,005 are getting raises, and the average raise is $3,156. That is a big number. Um, and uh, it's expensive, expensive to the taxpayers, but it is a significant, significant improvement for many of our employees. That doesn't mean everybody's going to get that number. Uh, we know that there are uh, some of our some of our employees in that band are getting uh, a much larger number. Uh, some are getting a smaller number, but the average for those 1,005 workers is 3,156. So I think that all in all, um, I, I really have appreciated your work. Uh, I, I know it's been very difficult because, first of all, it's incredibly complicated. And when we went through this, as we've gone through this at the work session and other briefings that you all have given us. Um, uh, I recognize uh, the complications of it and the difficulties of getting it right, but I think you all have really listened well, and I think that we've got, we've got a, we're going to have a better system. I am concerned that we keep evaluating how this is really working. Uh, you know, when, when I hear, uh, thinking about, you know, some of the things that we heard here tonight, uh, I, some of the things that we heard from some of our engineers, we really need to know if this is impacting our ability to hire those uh, skilled employees who, who are doing the engineering work and so forth that we need. And so I know you'll keep in close contact with that, uh, and I'm sure that the results will be vis very visible, uh, but I just want to urge us to continue to be in touch with that. So those are my comments, and I'll now ask if any other colleagues have any other comments as well. Briefly, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Reese. Appreciate your thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your remarks and the way that my colleagues have uh, have asked really difficult questions over the last couple of months, and respect the staff's work to improve the outcome and the process as we've gone along the way. As you know, Mr. Mayor, I 
was unable to be at the portion of the work session a week and a half ago in which these issues were addressed. I just have to say one quick word of thanks to the Mayor Pro Tem who uh, gamely uh, offered up a host of uh, concerns and questions that I had about that. I was fortunate enough because we have a great technology system to be able to listen to that recording afterwards and just thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, for your patience with me. Uh, I guess thanks staff uh, in my stead who had to deal with the questions that I left behind. Um, I do think, um, you know, the hardest part about um, this particular proposal all along has been the handful of dedicated city employees who have reached out to me uh, not on their own behalf, uh, not because they are concerned that their own earning potential would be reduced by the reduction of a salary range uh, in the years to come, not because they aren't, they feel like they deserve more money or a bigger raise. Uh, the most difficult part about me is that these folks, have, many of them we know and have worked with and I truly respect, are concerned not about themselves but about the folks that either work for them or, or concerned about their inability, their perceived inability to fill specific positions that they have been working on for perhaps multiple years. And that has been the deepest concern that I've had going through this whole process is that these are folks who obviously, obviously have the concern in mind not for their own well-being but for the good of the city. Um, and making sure that we get the work done that we need to do. Um, but I do think that in parallel to this important work, um, the Audit Services Committee, um, the Audit, Audit Services Department has put forward uh, a set of proposals around uh, vacancies and long-time vacancies that the administration has agreed with and the, especially the idea of putting together action plans for vacancies of greater than a year. Uh, you and I had a little bit of conversation about that uh, a week and a half ago. I just want to, um, again, say that I think we really need to uh, try to do more about positions. That the longer they're open, the more obvious the mismatch between the market and what we're offering in that position is. And we can do all the action plans we want, but if we're not, we're, we're not prepared to address that reality, we're going to continue to have problems. Um, but I think the proposal has moved far enough that I, that I can support it tonight. But I don't want to. I don't want to let that uh, turn a blind eye to the very real concerns that have been raised by the folks who've spoken here tonight, which have, I think, less to do with the comp and class plan and more to do with some of the other issues that we've continued to deal with since I've been in the council, and how we uh, interact, how management interacts with uh, the workers uh, who do the frontline work. And I just want to say that on 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 those issues, uh, I think this council will continue to work. Uh, to try to improve those relationships. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, Any time that we as members of the council get to hear from city employees is a good opportunity for us to learn how the work of the city actually happens. And so I respect and appreciate you guys being here tonight um, at 9 o'clock on a, on, a on a Monday night uh, when you, uh, I'm sure, have other things to do. Uh, those are my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. All right, if I don't hear any more comments, I will uh, accept a motion. I believe what we need is a motion just simply to adopt the general classification and compensation plan. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the general classification and compensation plan. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Again, uh, Ms. Youngblood, thank you for your work. Uh, very difficult, I know. Alethea, thank you, and all of you all who put so much into this. And now we all have to do our best to help you make it work. I want to thank everybody for being here. I think this is a, actually, in many ways, a great step forward. Uh, but I want you to know that we heard you uh, uh, and that uh, we appreciate the issues that you raised. Some of them are intimately related to this. Some of them are other uh, worker issues, which we appreciate hearing. Uh, I do want to just address one in particular, Ms. Vukalich, uh, I've raised with the city manager uh, prior uh, about the part-time pay, uh, and uh, he urged us, and I think rightly so, to wait till we got through this common class plan, which we now have, and so we'll be able to begin to take that up. Our, 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 uh, on July the 1st, our uh, city uh, Livable wage rises to $15.46 an hour. 
uh, which is a big improvement. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here and uh, appreciate you very much. All right, uh, now we're going to move to item 14, uh, the con consolidated annexation of 1309 Junction Road. This is a public hearing item, uh, and we'll hear first from staff. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. I would uh, first like to state for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with the state and local law, and affidavits, affidavits of all notices are on file in the Planning Department. Uh, this is case um, 1309, Junction Road. Uh, request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, Future land use map amendment and zoning map change have been received from Pam Porter, a TMT for one parcel of land located at 1309 Junction Road, totaling 33.31 acres. The annexation is for a contiguous expansion of the city limits. Yeah. In, in addition to the annexation, the applicant has applied for a zoning map change from rural residential to planned development residential 2.702 and a future land use map amendment from industrial to low density residential. If, to, if approved, the requested um, uh, annexation petition and associated applications would become effective on June 30th, 2019. Key commitments include limiting the permitted housing type as single family detached, limiting the impervious surface to 70%, adding a turn lane on Farrell Road at the site access, and providing additional asphalt for a bicycle lane. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water mains have the capacity for the proposed development. The Budget and Management Services Department determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following annexation. Additional information can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission at their February 12th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of nine to one. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Four motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The third is to adopt a consistency statement and the fourth is for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonia. Uh, council members, um, you've heard the report from staff. I'm going to now declare this public hearing open and ask if there are any questions from any members of council uh, or comments, uh, anything, any questions for staff at this time. If not, I'm going to uh, ask if there, uh, I see one speaker for this item, Pamela Porter. Are there any, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 14? Anyone else that would like to be heard? Ms. Porter is a proponent of this uh, rezoning. Ms. Porter, uh, Ms. Porter, I'm going to give you three minutes. If you need more than that, you can let me know. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Pam Porter with TMTLA Associates, 5011 South Park Drive in Durham. We are the applicant on this. Um, thank you, Jamie, for the presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Colleagues, questions or comments for Ms. Porter or staff at this time? Ms. Porter, I have a couple of questions. Sure. I noticed that, um, well, first of all, how many units uh, do you think that you will be developing on this property? Did I miss that? Um, it's a maximum of 90. Maximum of 90. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about the units that you're expecting to develop, price points, so forth? Sure. So. Um, 90 units is what we're proposing. It's going to be single family, detached, residential. Um, the price range is going to be an average of $275,000, and the average size of the house will be 2,200 square feet. Thank you. Um, have you, uh, or uh, has your client uh, considered a donation to the Durham, uh, the city of Durham's affordable housing fund? Yes, um, the, our client is willing to do $100 per unit for $9,000. Okay, thank you. 
You're also adding 18 students uh, to uh, Durham Public Schools. Have you, uh, as you know, uh, many of our developers uh, contribute uh, $500 per new student. Have you all considered that as well? Our client's willing to do the same, yes, $500 a student. All right, for the 18 students? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider that an acceptable proffer uh, in terms of, do you need any language? Uh, staff will accept the proffers and um, we will work with the applicant in terms of the standard language that is included on the development plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Uh, any questions for Ms. Porter? Any comments? If not, anybody else need want to be heard on this item? Ms. Porter, thank you very much. Thank you for your consideration. I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. Uh, this item requires four distinct motions, and the first would be to adopt an ordinance annexing the Junction Road subdivision. So moved. Second. second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the annexation ordinance. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. The second motion will be to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. So moved. Second. second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. The third motion will be adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And finally, motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. We'll now move to item 15. Thank you, Ms. Porter. We'll now move to item 15, zoning map, map changes for King's Daughters Inn, and we'll hear the report from staff. Good evening, I'm Emily Struthers for the Planning Department. Uh, it is my understanding that the applicant's agent, Mr. Jewell, intends on requesting a continuance of this case uh, to the June 3rd meeting. Mr. Jewell is in attendance if the mayor would like to recognize him. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Struthers. Mr. Jewell. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I am Dan Jewell. Um, I reside at 1025 Gloria Avenue. My good friends and neighbors, the Crossmans, who own the King's Daughters Inn, who are the applicants, um, uh, when they found the meeting was tonight, they are already had travel plans, they are out of town, and they have asked me to uh, respectfully request a continuance or deferral, whatever would be the appropriate request to the next available date as determined by planning. Thank you. Ms. Struthers, do we need to open the public hearing then and continue, or what would be your advice? Yes, staff would advise um, continuance. O opening the public hearing and then continuing it to June the 3rd, yes. 2019. Okay, thank you. I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and then I'm going to, uh, if there are no, no objections from colleagues, I'm going to hold the uh, public hearing open, and we will take this matter up again at our June the 3rd meeting. Mr. Jewell, Mr. thank Mayor, you very just much. Just briefly, I just want to make sure Mr. Jewell knows to tell your clients that that's the public hearing on the budget, um, and so they should bring a pillow or something until we're done. Do we do pillows now? I would, Is that a thing? I, I just wouldn't continue anything at June 3rd. <laughs> Doing what he's supposed to do. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Now we will move to item 16, zoning map change for Odyssey Towns, and we'll hear our report from staff. Good evening again. Um, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Uh, this case is Z18-00019 Odyssey Towns. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Jared Edens on behalf of Gary Wallace for three parcels located at 3500 NC55 Highway, 3614 NC55 Highway, and 5221 Penrith Drive. The site area totals 26.85 acres. 
The site is presently zoned Commercial Center CC without a development plan. Mr. Edens proposes to change this designation to Commercial General with a development plan CGD and Residential Suburban 8 with a development plan RS8D. The development plan proposes a maximum of 10,000 square feet of commercial and a maximum of 190 multifamily units. No units are proposed within the RS8D portion of the site. The properties are currently designated commercial, recreation open space, and low medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission at their February 12th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed CGD and RS8D zoning district by a vote of nine to one. Staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. We have now heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open and first I'm gonna ask if there are any questions from staff or comments by members of the council at this point. Hearing none, uh, it looks like we have one speaker signed up for this item, Mr. Jared Edens. Let me ask, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 16? Is there anyone else here tonight who would like, like to be heard on item 16? All right, if not, Mr. Edens, welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address, and uh, I'm gonna give you three minutes unless you think you're gonna need more. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank uh, you. Jared Edens with Edens Land, 2314 South Miami Boulevard in Durham, uh, 27703. I appreciate uh, Emily's summary of our project. I've just got a couple points I wanna touch on. I believe it's a really good location for density. If you look at the location at 55 and Odyssey, we've got ample water and sewer capacity in this area. Our adjacent roadways are well under capacity. So it's a good opportunity, in my opinion, to find density where we need it. Uh, Emily did mention we are also proffering to install a signal at the intersection of Odyssey and, and uh, 55. That was not, you normally don't see signal proffers when there's not a traffic study accompanying the project, but in this case, the DOT made us aware of an accident history at this intersection. My client was willing to, to offer the signal as part of the project to, to address that, so we are adding that. Um, also, I would just ask, if we look at that, at that node, you already have a single family housing, you got apartments, you know, the one option you're sort of missing is townhomes. So I feel like by adding townhomes here at the corner, we're really filling in the gap for the three different housing options we have right at that location. Uh, I have two proffers I would like to add. Um, staff report mentions 41 additional students uh, to the school system. Uh, we would like to proffer a $20,500 payment to Durham Public Schools prior to the first final plat for the project. I think it's typically how we do it. And our second proffer, we'd like to offer $30,000 uh, for Durham's affordable housing fund also made prior to the first final plat. I'm glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you for those proffers, Mr. Edens. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for staff or for Mr. Edens at this point? Mm -hmm. I have a question for staff. Um, oh, hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Great, one of the planning commissioners um, opposed this at the Planning Commission on the grounds that they thought that the um, development should have a residential designation on the FLUM uh, and the residence, residential zoning. But is there any other designation that would accommodate both residential and commercial, which is the proposed development plan here? Right, so good evening, Pat Young with Planning Department. Um, during the development of the currently adopted comprehensive plan in 2005, there was a lot of conversation around um, what would be permissible in different future land use map designations. And um, one of the areas of, of agreement at the end of the day was that um, commercial would be supportive of multifamily residential. So it really is the best, most appropriate designation for um, a project like this that has um, horizontal mixed use rather than vertical but doesn't have quite the density for that um, so I, does that answer your question and there's really not a more appropriate designation very helpful I think the the planning commissioner's concern was that the commercial would never actually happen um, but I think we get the same density either way uh, so 
All right, thank you. I just want to ask that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or any questions for Mr. Edens? All right. Uh, anyone else like to speak on this item? Anyone else like to be heard? If not, I'm going to uh, declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the Council. Uh, we'll need two motions. Uh, the first will be to adopt a consist consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please open the vote? Could you please close the vote? The motion passes five to two with council members Alston. I, I think it's actually seven to zero. I think it was a oh, uh, button pushing issue. Yes, sir, no. <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> seven okay. zero. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. And our second motion, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Second motion, we do adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the UDO. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? And please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Edens. Mr. Wallace, nice to see you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Others. All righty, we'll now be moving on to item 17, zoning map change for 707 Moorhead Avenue. Uh, welcome, Ms. Sunyak. Thank you. City Council approved a zoning map change and development plan for 707 Moorhead Avenue on July 28th, 1986. This was legacy case P86-35. <clears throat> this is a 2.88 acre tract of land located in the Moorhead Hill Local Historic District, and it's bounded by Moorhead Avenue, Vickers Avenue, Proctor Street, and Shepherd Street. This, the legacy case included a development plan that limited the group, the uses to group residents, a group facility, a recreation facility, and an admin building. The applicant, Robert Schunk from Stewart, has submitted an application to add a text commitment to the legacy case that would allow all residential uses permitted in the residential urban five, uh, parentheses two, district. No changes are being proposed to the rest of the approved development plan. Per the Unified Development Ordinance, any revision to text commitments are considered a significant change and require a new hearing and recommendation from the uh, Planning Commission prior to the case being considered by City Council. The Durham Planning Commission at their February 12th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the request by a vote of 10 to zero. The applicant has obtained a certificate of appropriateness as required by the, the Historic Resources Local Review uh, Criteria on December 4th, 2018 uh, from the Historic Preservation Commission for the relocation of the primary structure, modifications to the primary structure at 707 Moorhead Avenue and construction of 17 new townhome units. This information is informational only and should not be interpreted as a commitment. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is required to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. And I did want to make um, one point on motion two. There's a typo, and it should reference the residential urban five parentheses two zoning district and not the residential urban slash four. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Can you just, Ms. Sunyak, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Thank you. We've heard the report from staff. Ms. Sunyak, could you, on that second motion, yes. can you explain to me what you just uh, I actually think the ordinance is correct, but the agenda under set on item 17 listed it um, as a typo. So I'll just read it if if uh, you'd like to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Motion to adopt an ordinance amending, amending the Unified Development Ordinance by taking a property out of the residential urban dash five parentheses two with a development plan RU52 D Moorhead Hill Historic District Zoning District and establishing the same as residential urban dash five, parentheses two with a development plan RU52D, Moorhead Hill Historic District for the subject site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, colleagues, you have heard 
uh, from staff, and I'm going to first ask, are there any questions for staff or any comments from colleagues at this time? If not, um, we have, I see two speakers to this item. And um, those speakers are Mr. George Stanzial and Mr. Ken Spaulding. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 17? Is there anyone else here who would like to be heard on item 17? If not, uh, Mr. Stanzial and Mr. Spaulding, welcome. Um, I'm going to give you all each three minutes uh, if you need it. Okay. If you need more, you can let me know. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant uh, in this matter, uh, Moorhead Hill Townhomes. Uh, as was stated, it's 2.88 uh, acres in the urban tier. And also, as you're aware, in 1986, this property was rezoned to its current underlying zoning. However, it was limited at that time to be used as a brain rehabilitation center. Uh, the brain rehabilitation center has now been closed for approximately three years. The property is now languishing and decaying as the years go by. Our proposal today is only to remove the tax restriction for the vacant brain center and to follow and adhere to the under, current underlying zoning classification. The property will remain resi uh, residential with 17 new townhomes and the existing structures. One of the existing homes will be moved from one side of the, of the property to the other side of the property adjacent to a more compatible location near the existing residences. The main structure will be renovo renovated into two units. Uh, all of these uh, maintained structures have been submitted to Durham's Historic Preservation Commission and have been rigorously reviewed and approved by the commission. For approximately two years, the developer has met individually with neighbors affected by our proposal, as well as we set up a 600 foot perimeter meeting of all neighbors within this perimeter for review and discussion of our plans. This was not a requirement. This proposal has received unanimous support from the Durham Historic Preservation Commission and unanimous support and praise from the Durham Planning Commission. We feel that a high and sensitive approach to urban infill has been made by this developer and his team, and we are proud to offer this proposal to this city council for your consideration and hopefully your approval. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Uh, good evening, George Stanziel with uh, President and uh, uh, Director of Design at Stewart. Um, it's kind of weird looking at the screen with all these people going like this. Where is that, George? I don't, I'm not seeing it. Oh, the Wilbur Hodge. <laughs> I'm going to turn. All right. So, um, as Mr. Spaulding alluded to, this zoning is qu really quite simple. It sounds complicated, but it's really quite simple. We're not changing our zoning district. We're not adding traffic. We're not adding students over the existing zoning. We're merely adding by text all the residential uses allowed in the RU 52 district, similar to the Moorhead Hill. Uh, our neighbor, Moorhead Hill neighborhood, our, is, which is our neighboring community to the west, beyond uh, the institutional use that current, uh, currently exists. Um, as I pointed out uh, to, to all of you in the emails that I sent, we're bringing forward to the city another uniquely designed infill project in the urban tier that is walkable to downtown. We'll create a wonderful streetscape with sidewalks, on-street parking, streets, street trees, landscape, lighting, and most importantly, will preserve and en enhance two historically significant homes from Durham's past. Land in Durham is becoming extremely scarce, something I could have never imagined when I moved here f 34 years ago. With the renaissance of our downtown and significant increases in urban job centers, we're seeing the need for quality infill development of reasonable density that is walkable and accessible to the incredible amenities of our downtown. Section 4.3.2 of the comprehensive plan policies are clear that infill development is critical to the success of our urban uh, areas and suggests densities of six to 12 units per acre in the urban tier. 
our density is 6.9 units per acre. These policies suggest that compatible residential development on, on vacant or underutilized land should be developed to preserve existing neighborhood character and development patterns. Our project provides an alternative lifestyle at a similar density and land use pattern to the historic Moorhead Hill neighborhood while creating a transition from the office and institutional uses to the east uh, over to the single family detached uh, Moorhead Hill neighborhood to the west. That said, we have been unanimously approved by and received our certificate of appropriateness from the historic commission. This extensive approval uh, involved, it's very exhaustive uh, and very highly detailed, uh, involved uh, application and review, uh, an ap application review process that included very specific illustrative site plans, access, building locations, landscape, lighting, paving materials, open spaces, and private courtyards. The approval also includes existing and proposed building elevations where we considered architectural features from homes in the Moorhead Hill neighborhood, uh, materials, and lighting. Just one second. Go ahead. This includes the renovation and restoration of the two existing historic homes. In addition, we've been unanimously approved, um, as Mr. Spaulding said, by the Planning Commission with a very positive comments from both, both commissions. The development of our project will be guided by the, our certificate of appropriateness, and any changes would be uh, would be a, uh, would require approval by the historic commission. So all of the things that were committed to and approved by the historic commission, um, while not part of this development plan, are guided uh, by the historic commission, and any changes we make to it would have to go to the historic commission. Uh, this is actually fairly unusual. Uh, in a zoning where you have this level of detail. Um, while this project has significant and uh, unique costs related not only to the design and execution quality of the new homes, but more significantly, the relocation and renovation of one historic home and renovation of the main historic residence, we would like to offer a one-time contribution <coughs> to the Durham Affordable Housing Trust Fund of $20,000 to be paid prior to final plat approval. We greatly appreciate your support and are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the proffer. Um, colleagues, uh, questions or comments for the applicant or for staff? It's definitely a comment. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate whenever a local developer finds it in their space and time to make uh, room for neighbors and conversation around the development that they're working on. I can't say it enough. Um, it is not a requirement, even though it should be. Um, and I appreciate you doing that. And I uh, also want to share that, uh, I mean, it's really like coming from the Planning Commission and watching projects move in this direction is really like um, heartfelt. And recognizing that, I think that our developer community is recognizing that we have to work together to figure out what redevelopment, development, and infill looks like moving forward. And I'm looking forward to the presentation on Thursday that uh, John Colleen will be providing to share more around the trends so that we have the data to make these decisions um, that will support moving more of us in this direction so that we're collectively working to create um, the context and the structures and the supports that we need to increase density in a way that's going to include everyone. And so I'm, I'm, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the proffer and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions by members of council? Council Member Reese? It's real quick, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, jump on the bandwagon here and say that we often talk about the um, type of approach we want our developers to take uh, with neighborhood residents and with nearby neighboring homeowners. Um, and so I think it's only fair and right that we um, call out and praise that behavior when we see it come before us. And I think um, this developer's done a fantastic job of getting that kind of input and consensus before coming to us. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add, Mr. Mayor, is that the original uh, zoning for this, um, the zoning map change and development plan, 
uh, was done uh, when I just shortly after I got my learner's permit. Um, and so I think it's probably fair to say that a lot has changed since then, uh, including the uh, appropriate use for this particular property. And I'll be supporting the uh, various motions tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? If Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this public hearing matter? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we'll need two motions. The first would be to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Mr. Mayor, if you will. Uh, staff just wants the opportunity to massage the language of the proffer just slightly mm -hmm. uh, because we are not aware if they would need a final plat. So we'd like the opportunity to add um, the uh, contribution prior to the final plat or the first CO, whichever, whichever is applicable. Thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. No, Thank I'm you. glad you interrupted. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's try again on the motion uh, to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Clerk, oh, I'm sorry. Second. Been moved by Mark Anthony and seconded by Charlie. <laughs> the motion passes 7-0. Oh, all right. Thank you. Uh, and then motion two, and we'll just remember that motion two is um, we'll be adopting as corrected by Ms. Sunyak um, in her initial remarks. So moved. Second. Second. To adopt the ordinance amending the UDO, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And good luck with the project. All righty, uh, we're now down to item 18, public hearing on an approval of the draft FY 2019-20 annual action plan. This is also a public hearing item. Greetings, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, <coughs> Reginald Johnson, Director, Department of Community Development. The item before you is the draft annual action plan. We're asking that you hold a public hearing uh, on this, on the actual annual action plan, and then adopt the annual action plan. I'll introduce to you Ms. Will McConyers, Federal Programs Coordinator, to read the particulars into the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Welcome, Ms. Conyers. Good evening, Mayor Shule and members of council. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comments on the draft FY1920 annual action plan. The annual action plan specifies how the city of Durham will address housing and community development needs through the use of community development block grant, known as CDBG, the Home Investment Partnership Program, known as HOME, the Emergency Solutions Grant, known as ESG, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, known as, known as HOPWA. The draft annual action plan was made available through public review from March 14th through April 15th, 2019. Notice of this meeting was advertised in the Herald Sun and the Capasa newspaper on March 14th and the Carolina Times on March 16th and via a general listserv. As a recipient of CDBG, home, ESG, and HOPWA funds, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings. The first public hearing was held on November 18th, 2018. For planning purposes, the city used the anticipated allocations contained in the draft FY1920 annual action plan. On last Friday, April 12th, HUD published the final entitlement allocations and they are as follows. For CDBG, we expect to receive $1,988,113. For the home program, $1,082,516. For ESG, $169,200. And for HOPWA, $429,110. The amounts in the final plan will be revised to align with the final allocations and the contingency language that was previously pu published. A summary of the comments from all public hearings and written comments received from citizens will be incorporated into the final annual action plan. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Conyers. Uh, I'm going to, you've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and I'm going to first ask if there are any questions or comments for staff from members of the council. I do have one question. Uh, could you, the, 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 what's the CDBG number that we've been allocated? The final allocation announced last Friday is one million nine hundred eighty-eight thousand one hundred and thirteen dollars. Okay. Thank you. So they're very close to the summary numbers that you gave us in the memo, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I have not. I have not had anyone sign up for this item. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone present that would like to speak on this item? If not, council members, any questions or comments for Ms. Conyers? If not, Ms. Conyers, any other comments? If not, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. And uh, thank you very much. No additional comments. All right, thank you. Uh, I believe that that is all the business to come before. We need to stop this. So oh, I'm sorry. What do we need to do? Ms. Conyers, the council needs to take an action to approve this, correct? Yes, we're asking that the city council adopt the annual action plan. I'm sorry. Thank you. I about, I about adjourned us. <laughs> no move, Mr. Mayor. It's been moved that we, and seconded that we adopt the annual action plan. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. And I'm going to now declare this meeting adjourned at 938. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.